Welcome. I'm so glad to see all of you. So many uh, fantastic faces. I'm never happier than I are than I am with uh, folks who are uh, working hard to keep the planet up and running. Um, so we have an amazing uh, panel with us tonight. Amazing group of folks, and of course, more amazing because all of you are here willing to help us out. Um, my name is Tim Giddy. I'm the president of Climate Action Now. Brett Walter is here with us. Brett was the founder of the company. Neither of us take a penny. Um, this is a, very much a labor of love. Um, so in just a minute, we're going to put up a QR code. Um, and you're going to need to, if you have a phone available, get your phone, turn the camera on. Um, you're going to want to capture that QR code because it's going to let you go to a whole bunch of actions that uh, that were created, 210 actions were created specifically for tonight by Anshul Gupta, who is, I saw somewhere in there. Um, so you're not only gonna listen to uh, these extraordinary experts on, on the, the HEAT Act, you'll be able to take substantive action. If you've never used uh, Climate Action Now, Climate Action Now is a free phone app lets you take thousands of actions on the climate crisis in seconds. Uh, and um, every time you take an action, you get points. Every time you get enough points, we plant a tree for you. We've planted over 200,000 trees and people using the app have taken over 2 million actions, sending emails, making phone calls to elected officials and business leaders, and you can join them tonight. And in fact, this sort of trade-off for the valuable time of our panel is that you're going to do that. So, um, Brett, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and put up the QR code for folks. And if you've never seen a QR code, if you just take your camera on your phone and aim it at that strange looking square, uh, a link will appear. If you tap on the link, uh, that will take you to the actions for tonight. And I'm going to give everybody a second to do that. We don't want to leave anybody behind. There's also, as you'll see, a goal tracker on the left. Uh, people have already taken action. 146 emails have already gone out. Uh, and I should mention that all of the actions are going to be on the app tomorrow and the next day. So encourage your friends to get on and, and take the actions too. And usually, there are a lot more actions that continue to be taken afterwards. By the way, this app really thrives uh, on its users. So if you enjoy the experience of it, please invite your friends to get on it. Again, I'm not earning a penny from this thing. Um, so uh, I will quickly mention we're having uh, a, and I'll tell you more about it. I'll put information in the chat we're having a uh, another one of these action parties for the Environmental Voter Project in a couple of days with the Environmental Voter Project's president, Nathaniel Stinnett. Um, so uh, I want to just before we uh, start, uh, two quick other things. Number one, I want to thank our sponsors for tonight, uh, New Yorkers for Clean Power. We act for environmental justice, the Sierra Club Atlantic Chapter, New York Geo, Nest, the uh, New York Climate Reality Project Chapters Coalition, the Alliance for a Green Economy, Mothers Out Front, Sane Energy Project, and Climate Action Now. Um, I also want to tell you uh, our speakers will be answering questions in the second half of the evening. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, and, and you can, if you're shy, you can direct mail them to me. Uh, in the chat, and and we will answer your questions in the second half. And uh, Brett, I didn't see. We're we're looking at a goal of 200 actions. So let's get on this thing and uh, get 200 emails uh, sent. And it's my giant honor to pass this over to our guest host for the night, Geraldine Hughes, who has literally been on Broadway a million gazillion times, although she disputes that. Um, and you've seen her in lots of TV and movies. She's in uh, season two of Tokyo Vice on coming up on HBO. She's the executive producer of the film The Last Rifleman. Um, 
starring Pierce Brosnan and the producer uh, on the new film, The Land of Saints and Sinners, starring Liam Neeson and Kieran Hines. My giant joy in welcoming Geraldine Hughes. Thank you very much, Tim Guinea. I feel like you're talking about somebody else. Um, you know, I have done Broadway and stage, but it's very intimidating to be on here with all of you fantastic, smart, incredibly socially conscious humans. Anyway, it's my job to introduce uh, the panel. So um, we have uh, Jessica Azule, who is the executive director of the Alliance for Green Energy, AGREE, with more than 20 years of experience in multi-issue grassroots organizing. Jessica has led AGREE since 2011. She, uh, they are published author on participatory workplace practice and movement strategy. They graduated from Sarah Lawrence College, focusing on political economy and international economics. Before coming to Agree, Jessica worked professionally as a nonprofit publisher, editor, and journalist with the award-winning hard news website, The New Standard, where she honed her research and communication skills. And then we have uh, Raya Salter, who is an attorney, consultant, educator, and clean energy law and policy expert with a focus on energy and climate justice. Raya is the founder of the Energy Justice Law and Policy Center and a member of the New York State Climate Action Council, the body that developed New York's plan to implement its nation leading climate law. Raya is an adjunct professor of law at Cardoza Law School and has written widely on energy policy. And her book, Energy, Justice, Domestic and International Perspectives, was released by Edward Elgar in 2018. And last but not least, Lisa Marshall is the advocacy and organizing director at New Yorkers for Clean Power, which she joined in 2022 after serving as program director of Heat Smart Tompkins. A longtime member of the Renewable Heat Now campaign team, Lisa has been at the forefront of advocacy for building energy efficiency and heat pump adoption policy at the state level, where she advocates for bringing affordable, equitable building electrification to scale through education and outreach, messaging, lobbying, and building grassroots pressure on elected officials and state agencies. Woo! Hey, Geraldine, before you guys get going, I just want to mention people have already burst through our first goal of sending 200 emails to elected officials. You guys rock in the audience. So let's go ahead and uh, reset that goal, Brett, if you could knock it up to 350, I don't know. And we're waiting on Raya. Raya Salter will be joining us uh, soon. So I guess we open up the discussions. Maybe Lisa can begin or whoever would like to begin. Jessica is first and I will go ahead and share my screen. And I think Raya is signed on, but maybe as an audience member, I think maybe I saw her. She might want to take a look, but I think she was signed on under the organization name possibly. I could yes, be wrong. She, she's here under EJLPC. Right, that's what yeah. I um, Okay, so great. <laughs> find her and give her hosting privileges so she'll be able to unmute herself and speak. That would be great. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and Jessica, um, I'll turn it to Jessica Ashley. Oh my goodness. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, for sharing your screen. And thank you to everybody who's here tonight. We're so excited to be taking action with all of you to pass the New York Heat Act. Again, I'm Jessica Azule. I'm Executive Director at Alliance for a Green Economy, and we're one of the members of the Renewable Heat Now campaign, um, which, is a, which is a campaign consisting of uh, 20 statewide groups joined together to accelerate the adoption of ground source, also known as geothermal and air source heat pumps in New York, and to reduce the amount of fossil fuels used to heat and cool our homes and workplaces. And we work with over 200 organizations across the state to make this happen. We educate the public about heat pumps, and we also advocate for New York state policies that will enable New Yorkers to afford to make the switch to renewable heating and cooling technologies like the New York Heat Act. 
Next slide, Lisa. Um, so just wanna talk a little bit about why we focus on heating and cooling our buildings. Buildings are New York's largest source of greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels for heating, hot water, cooking, um, as well as the methane leaks along the gas fracking and distribution system that gets all of that fracked gas to our homes. Um, so it's a huge part of our climate crisis, and we are focusing there to reduce the emissions um, from that sector. Next slide. Um, so Lisa's going to drop in the chat um, some links to some information about the New York Heat Act as I go, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what the New York Heat Act does. Next slide. So all New Yorkers deserve safe, comfortable, and affordable homes and buildings where we can live, work, and play. And that is what the New York Heat Act is all about, because our outdated laws have rigged the system in ways that force us to keep burning increasingly expensive and toxic fracked gas. The New York Heat Act unrigs the system, freeing our state to build cutting edge electric and thermal energy networks that are more reliable, safer, and more affordable. The New York Heat Act will liberate money that we're currently dumping into the toxic fracked gas system so that we have the funding necessary to ensure that all people have access to energy efficiency and electrification upgrades that will benefit our health and the climate and so when we pass the New York Heat Act, we'll finally move past the old laws that are holding New York in the past and move into the cleaner, healthier, and more affordable future that we deserve. Next slide. So why are we doing this now? After years of organizing across New York State, the New York climate movement pulled off historic wins in 2019 when we passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, also known as the Climate Act, and, and further historic wins in 2022 and 2023. In 2022, our movement passed the Advanced Building Codes and Appliance Standards Act, clearing the way to require that our buildings and the appliances we are sold in stores will save energy and save us money. We also worked that year with labor unions to pass the Utility Thermal Energy Network and Jobs Act, which is leading utilities to pilot thermal energy networks all over New York, bring, bringing clean fossil fuel heating and cooling to neighborhoods and demonstrating how we will scale this transition. And then last year, thanks to the tireless work of Renewable Heat Now, Gas Free NYC, and so many others, we overcame the fossil fuel lobby to pass the All Electric Building Act, requiring that new buildings in New York State will be built without fossil fuels. So we've secured a pollution-free future for new buildings, but there's a lot of pieces left before we can declare full climate victory in New York. And one of those is ensuring that New Yorkers who are currently stuck with unsafe and increasingly unaffordable gas and other fossil fuels for heating and hot water and cooking are enabled and funded to move into a pollution-free future too. Hey, Jessica, I got to interrupt just briefly because they already banged through the second goal of 350 emails. Let's go amazing. to 500. You guys are doing amazing. All right. Keep taking those actions. So we've got a lot of momentum and we're we're working on this critical goal. But the bad news is the fossil fuel industry is still going all out to prevent us from finishing the job. The good news is support for the New York Heat Act has never been stronger. Next slide. So the New York Heat Act helps New Yorkers in four major ways. Fighting climate change, creating safer and cleaner homes, bolstering green jobs and a strong economy, and ensuring energy affordability across the state. So I'm going to talk about all of these. The language of the bill is pretty wonky because it's changing arcane public service laws. I'm going to focus on key components and impacts of the bill, but we encourage you to feel free to do some dig or deeping on deeper digging on your own. Um, we will be sharing resources throughout this 
um, event tonight if you want to go deeper. So next slide. Um, extreme weather defined the summer. We suffered through dangerous smoky air, record-breaking heat, flooding that washed away our roads, knocked out trains, destroyed homes. We saw people die from extreme storms and unbreathable air all over New York. We can't keep asking people to pay more and more for the dirty fossil fueled gas system that's killing them. And New York Heat stops this by discontinuing an old law, which is informally called the 100 foot rule that makes New Yorkers subsidize the expansion of the gas system on our energy bills. And it also dis it changes the obligation to serve, which currently mandates that utilities serve fracked gas, but doesn't mandate them to help people access renewable heating. New York Heat allows the state to achieve strong climate justice and emissions reductions as outlined in our Climate Act and enable significant reductions of fossil fuel use in buildings by 2050 because it aligns public service law with the Climate Act so that we can actually invest in efficient and clean electric home, solu home energy solutions that are called for in the Climate Action Plan. It enables neighborhood scale solutions from fossil fuel thermal energy networks, fossil, sorry, fossil free thermal energy networks that will leave no no one stranded on the costly gas system. Under New York heat, utilities will still be obligated to provide safe and reliable service and to invest in keeping the gas system safe for as long as it's around. But they will have options to avoid costly gas line replacements and provide customers with renewable heating technologies. So utilities will be able to comply with the Climate Act. Remember, buildings are our largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, so this legislation is absolutely critical for New York to meet its climate goals. Next slide. For health and safety, our communities face unrelenting pollution both inside and outside of our homes right now. The New York Heat Act frees people from these health burdens associated from breathing in unhealthy air from burning fossil fuels. Outside, it stops the expansion of the dirty toxic gas system that causes toxic um, pollution fueled by climate, fly the climate crisis like wild smoke, wildfire smoke and extreme heat. Inside, it makes it easier and faster for us to phase out fossil fuel appliances used for space and water heating, which emit toxic nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, fine particulate matter and carbon dioxide. The health impacts caused by this pollution disproportionately burden vulnerable populations, including children, the elderly, low-income communities, communities of color, renters, and individuals with pre-existing health conditions. New York Heat enables utilities to invest in neighborhood scale clean heating and cooling projects like thermal energy networks, and this will result in safe, comfortable, healthy homes and less polluted neighborhoods. Next slide. For jobs and the economy, our current system is wasting our money on the ant antiquated fracked gas system. Collectively, Utilities are investing over $200 million every year into unnecessary expansion of gas infrastructure, and these costs end up on all of our utility bills, plus interests and shareholder payouts. Profit-chasing gas utilities are still trying to maintain and replace their pipelines despite the state's mandated path to a fossil-free future even when there are more affordable and climate-friendly options that would allow us to retire unsafe gas pipelines and give people renewable heating options instead. If we don't act, the financial burden of maintaining and expanding our gas system is going to continue to fall on the backs of consumers like us, even as these systems become obsolete. We simply cannot afford this. Getting off of gas and going all electric in the next 30 years is a massive net positive job creator. More than 200,000 new jobs would be created in the building sector. 
And the New York Heat Act requires prevailing wage for projects that utilities will build instead of gas pipelines, making sure that the replacement for pipeline jobs will also pay family sus sustaining wages. We and are committed- Yes, I'm interrupting you yet again, which is my favorite thing to get to do because you guys broke yet another goal of 500 emails have gone out to the legislature. It's fantastic. Um, Brett, can we knock it up to 800 because they're making short work of these smaller increments? This is amazing. Thank you so much to everybody who is um, taking all of these actions. Let's keep going. And I hope to get interrupted more times as I keep going. Um, so we're committed to making um, intentional plans to protect the long-term li livelihood of today's gas workers and bring disadvantaged communities into the workforce for building electrification. Highly skilled and trained plumbers, pipe fitters, steam and steam fitters perform jobs that are vital to the clean energy economy and pay good wages. And this is why we've worked with the Upgrade Collaborative to pass the Utility Thermal Energy Network and Jobs Act that creates a pathway for gas workers to build clean thermal energy networks and this transition and to also bring in new people from local communities and disadvantaged communities into this workforce. New York Heat supports the thermal energy network, union jobs, and facilitates a just transition for workers. Next slide. On the energy affordability front, um, it's really important for all of us to know and remember that right now our utility bills are regressive. What this means is the poorest pay the most, relatively speaking. The lowest income New Yorkers spend an average of 13% of their income on energy, while the highest income families pay less than 2% of their incomes for energy. And this isn't fair. So the New York Heat Act will make energy bills more fair by creating an affordability protection. New York Heat creates strategies to ensure that residential rate payers will not pay more than 6% of their income for utility bills. For the lowest income families, this could result in an average savings of $75 a month on their energy bills, which will make sure they have more money for food, rent, and medicine. New York Heat also supports all New Yorkers by reducing how much gas expansion and gas infrastructure investments we're forced to pay for on our energy bills and providing funding for retrofits so that all of us can afford to make the transition and make the switch. So New York Heat is a pro-climate bill that will also cut costs and save us money. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to my friend and colleague, Lisa Marshall, who's gonna talk more about the movement to pass New York Heat and all of the amazing work going on all across New York to get this critical bill over the finish line. Thanks so much, Jessica. And thanks to all of you for taking these great actions. I had a lot of fun advancing the slides and also sending emails this whole time. So I'm just gonna quickly talk about um, what we've been up to to try to get this um, bill passed. Because as Jessica mentioned, the fossil fuel opposition to this bill is very fierce. And um, we just cannot meet our climate reduction mandates under New York law without passing this bill. So we've been doing a lot of organizing and power building across the state. Um, all summer and fall, we were focused on the governor. We had um, uh, these fantastic ice cream events in New York where legislators gave out ice cream. We had what we called the chili tour in the fall where we went to 13 cities in New York, served up chili, cooked on induction stoves, um, taught people about building electrification and asked them to help pack, pass the New York Heat Act. We had two mobilizations um, in November, one um, with just youth climate activists in Albany and on the same day, a big mobilization in New York City and um, many, many meetings with the governor and her staff, um, all asking the same thing. Also, we had a sign on letter over 200 organizations signed, all asking the same thing of the governor, which is to put the New York Heat Act into her executive budget. And what happened? The governor did put 
very big portions of the New York Heat Act into her executive budget a couple of weeks ago. Um, we were very gratified to see a very thoughtful um, section of her budget on, that covered the so-called 100-foot rule. Those are those subsidies to the gas industry for expanding the gas system and the obligation to serve. That's the law that says if anybody wants a gas hookup, they can get one. And the governor has addressed both of those things, which are um, real meaningful things for both climate and affordability as they will reduce future costs. But the, what the governor didn't have in her budget was that 6% income limit per household on energy. And um, so we're still needing to fight for that. And we need to fight for all of those parts of the New York Heat Act to be in the so-called one house budgets. Those are the budgets that the assembly and the Senate put out. Um, so that's what's next up for us. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with New York State and how our legislature works, um, we, our legislature meets from January until June, and then the rest of the year they are not in session. So from January, February, and March, all that they work on is the budget. And after that is all the other work that they do. And they end actually, it's not a full month in June. I think they end sort of June 9th or 10th. So the best way for us to pass this bill is in the budget, because it is a difficult bill, a controversial bill because of the opposition from the fossil fuel industry. Um, we've been advised by uh, many smart people to try to pass it in the budget. So the first step was to get it in the governor's budget, which we were really happy to see uh, a lot of the bill in the governor's budget and her showing that leadership. And now we're really turning our attention to the two houses, this New York State Senate, which actually passed the bill last year, and the assembly where there are, I think, about 74 co-sponsors, um, which is a very good number. But this assembly has been the harder house to convince in the past, and so we're really focused very heavily on them. While not neglecting our friends in the Senate, we need them to do what they did last year and put it in their budget. And so um, for the next eight weeks or so, we're going to be laser focused um, on, well, the, the next few weeks will be focused on the one house budgets. And then once the one house budgets come out, there's a three way negotiation between the legislature and the governor. And so we're going to be focusing on everybody to make sure that whatever came out of New York heat in the budgets ends up in the final budget or what's called the final budget bill is called fondly the big ugly bill in New York. So we want it to end up in the big ugly. And so we're going to be working very hard and we need all of you to help because um, the opposition is not leaving any stone unturned to try to defeat climate action in New York. And they know that if they can figure out how to defeat us here in New York, they're going to be able to defeat us elsewhere in the country. So what are we going to do to build um, up the power and voice of of the climate movement in New York to pass this act. Well, um, we have been working hard, as I said, through the summer and the fall. We were excited to see the governor's budget. We just then pivoted to the legislature last week. We had a massive rally in Lobby Day in Albany, over 300 advocates screaming for a, a phased gas transition <laughs> on the steps of the Capitol building. and. Um, and all of those um, advocates then met with legislators um, and their staffers to ask for the inclusion of the New York Heat Out Act in the budget. Coming up in February, we're going to be doing what we are doing tonight, sending those emails, meeting, and then meeting with legislators both in district, that's home where you live, and in Albany, and also um, keeping up the pressure on social media and in the newspapers. And we are inviting you to join us for our next big rally in Lobby Day um, in March, on Wednesday, March 13th, or is it the 14th? I think that's a typo, actually. Well, we'll check, but we're going to put the link to that in the chat. Um, um, but we will, um, that's a Wednesday. So if the 13th is the wrong day, I'm sorry. I was kind of tired when I made these slides. And then what we hope to see is um, a really great version of the New York Heat Act in the final budget passed by April 1st. If it does not pass, of course, we'll keep fighting, but this is um, the next eight weeks are absolutely critical every single day. So here's just a picture of our amazing um, 
movement gathered um, in Albany last week on the million dollar staircase, uh, you know, young and old, um, black and white, everybody, just a cross section of New York from um, Brookhaven to Buffalo gathered together um, calling for the New York Heat Act to pass. Um, this week, we are doing a co-branded social media action on Wednesday with the New York Renews campaign. Um, and the link to that will be shared in the chat to sign up. All you need to do is post on social media on Wednesday. It's so easy. So please join us for that. We'll give you the link. Um, we have our campaign has a monthly grassroots meeting on Zoom. The next one is this coming Thursday on February 1st. And we really invite you to join. That's where you're going to um, learn more about this, take action with us. And um, each month we sort of map out the strategy and the actions that we're gonna be taking where we might be having regional press conferences, we might be um, do, emailing more legislators and requesting district meetings, et cetera. So please join us for that. And again, we'll share the link for that in the chat. And finally, um, as I said, the March 13th, oh, it is the 13th, oh good. Um, mobilization in Albany. If you are able to join us in Albany, um, please sign up and, um, and the link that's provided and we will be happy to see you there, assign you to a lobby team. Um, you don't have to have any experience lobbying. You don't have to have ever been to Albany before. We have very experienced, caring and fun lobby team leaders who will guide you through the whole experience. And that's it for me. So I think that's my last slide, yep. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn you back over to Tim and company. Thanks so much. Hey, and I'm gonna actually jump in really quickly and let's take a little brief pause because we've had a couple folks asking um, how to get on. So on the right, you'll see, and we're up to 721 emails that you guys have sent out. Now, I'm just gonna say, our friend Anshul Gupta created over 221 messages that you guys can send out. So don't slow down, let's all keep going. If you haven't signed onto the app yet, the weird looking square on the right is a QR code. Turn your phone on, turn the camera on your phone on, point it at that uh, square, a link will appear on your phone. If you tap the link, it will take you directly to all of these actions that people are taking. Um, I hope we've given you enough time because we want to get to the fabulous Raya Salter. Raya, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. I mean, even just to go ahead and encourage folks, please go ahead and use those links. Keep hitting send. Every message matters. Um, you know, do the calling, the writing, the emails. Um, I'm inclined to be encouraging till we get to 800. I mean, can we get 800? <laughs> can we get, can we get 751? Can we get 753? <laughs> um, and yes, my name is Raya Salter. I also go by Climate Auntie, where you can find me on Instagram. I'm the founder and executive director of the Energy Justice Law and Policy Center. Can we get a 758? Can we, wait, what happened? What happened, my friend? What happened, Tim? We seem to have hit eight, we seem no. to have hit 800 and then we went backwards. No, no, we're going up. <laughs> We were all so excited to hit 800. <laughs> all right, baby Ella. Sounds like I think we. Is it fair to say, Tim? We we hit 800. Oh, I think we can't Tim, hear you're you. Muted. Tim, you're muted. Oh, he's muted. <laughs> I'm sorry, Raya Salter. I was muted. Um, no, we're on our way to 800. We're oh, okay. I thought 25 away. Oh, uh, all right. Okay. Well, it seemed like from the clock that we were really close to 800. So I was just going to be encouraging, but I, I'm sure that by the time I am done speaking, we will have reached 800 for sure. So hello, everybody. It's great to see you. Um, if I hope that there are a bunch of you who I've met before at a rally or an action or online, and if not, hello, I'm really glad to meet you. 
I'm the uh, executive director of the Energy Justice Law and Policy Center, um, longtime friend of the room, used to work for New York Renews, um, and served on the New York State Climate Action Council, where I guess what I want to tell you, I didn't uh, bring any slides and I won't talk long. Okay, wait. Yeah, yes, we reached our goal of 800. Yay. <laughs> I think this means Brett, we can set a higher goal, but. Um, Brett, I let's think... kick it up to 1,000. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> We're going to do it. Uh, but I just so. I, I want to encourage people because it really is important that folks get involved. And I, you know, I hope that you send the emails. I hope that you attend the rallies and do all the things. And many of you probably already have. I've missed out on the chili. I'm hoping that comes back so I can get some of that chili because I missed that. And I missed the ice cream. We need to get some of that popping in my area so I can help hand it out and also get some. Um, but I think. I just, I wanted to emphasize a few things. And really, you know, as, as folks who've been with us for a minute, you know, throughout that whole Climate Action Council process, and I can say definitely from the inside, that it really is a, I hate war analogies, but a war of attrition. It's a day-to-day -day constant back and forth with the gas utilities in the energy industry. They are 100,000% determined that they um, will not see a piece of their infrastructure removed or downsized or truly just um, you know taken away because we need to get off of gas to meet our climate goals pursuant to our climate law. That's what that is what we're facing. Unless we can get them to stand down, we cannot meet the requirements of the of our Climate Act, the CLCPA, because in order to meet those requirements, we have to stop using so much gas, period. And we need to understand that the utilities make their money by investing in and maintaining the gas system that they have, and they don't want to see it in any way downsized or dismantled. The amount of time that I spent going back and forth over the word downsize with the gas utilities was really, I mean, no one should have to go back and forth on the word downsize as much. I think at one point they were like, strategic downsize? Str I think strategic downsize is where we, we landed up. But um, at the end of the day, the gas utilities still didn't vote for the plan. So the idea that there is a strong, well-funded, resilient, and politically powerful lobby that is also engaging in misinformation campaigns that is in uh, that goes all the way really at every level they lobby at the state they're in your local community causing folks to be you know to be nervous about what the climate act is going to do they're talking to workers to say they should be nervous about what the climate act is going to do so it's really not to be underestimated which is why it's just so important um, that you're on to, you know, that you are here um, tonight and supporting this act. I also wanted to say that to talk a little bit more about the dynamics of what's uh, what I see. I think that Lisa and Jessica were spot on with the analysis in terms of what's going on at the legislature and what needs to happen in the next couple of weeks. But to me, it was real interesting, you know, the idea of getting rid of this 100 foot rule, like this really what what we're trying to do is conform new york state law the way that utilities are governed to our climate act right and if our law says we need to keep hooking folks up to gas you know the utilities have to do that then you know that maybe is not in line with um you know with what we need to do if we're going to reach the goals of our climate act um and while making some of those changes are extremely important and will mean leadership on this issue. I want to say too that these aren't, you know, these were supported by the, the, the climate action scope, climate action council scoping plan. This is something that's been supported by the department of public service and the department of environmental conservation. And so we want to give the governor credit for being progressive and adding these pieces in her budget, but we want to keep our eye always, our eye on the ball 
um, in terms of what is really pushing to create real affordability for folks and is actually going to stand down the industry. And that I think is what makes the push for New York Heat so incredibly important. We need all of these provisions, not just some, and we need to be on constant vigilance and guard on uh, the fossil fuel lobby and what their influence is on this process. So I just want to say, I know it's, um, you know, sound, you know, regulatory law and these rules and regulations, you know, can not be sort of like the most exciting thing to fight for, but pushing on this issue is everything in terms of meaningful progress on meeting our Climate Act's goals and meaningful progress on standing down the gas industry. If we can't do it in New York State, I don't think we can do it anywhere. And that's another reason why it's so important for you to support this, for you to learn up, for you to get in community, for you to show up. Oh, 1,000, give me 1,000. Okay, done. I will toss it back to our hosts. I'm going to turn it over to uh, to our friend Geraldine, who I think has some questions from the audience. And Brett, let's knock it up to 1,200. I think we can do it. <laughs> that was amazing. It was like Raya timed it perfectly. It was amazing. Amazing. It's magic. It's magic. Um, all right. I know we're it's only so much time. There was someone in the chat who... Um, Annette asked, has the New York Assembly passed the bill yet? And maybe I missed it. So can someone speak to that? Lisa? Yes, Annette, that's such a great question. No, the so this is our third year of trying to get the bill passed, which is a little confusing because the first year it didn't have such a catchy name. Um, but it is the third year and the state Senate has passed it both in their, put it in their budget and passed it as a standalone, but the assembly has not. And that is why we're really laser focused on the assembly and the leadership, Carl Hasty and all of the committee chairs and people close to um, as Speaker Hasty to try to really push it this time because um, they have a little, they have a little line that they say, we don't put policy in the budget so it's not that we don't like your bill it's just this is our thing but of course they do put policy in the budget all the time <laughs> when they want to so um it is not a budget bill it is not a bill that impacts the the balance sheet of the state but it is a bill that needs to pass in the budget for just purely political reasons and it should and with all of your help it will <laughs> Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, we often hear concerns about whether the electric grid can keep up with the electrifications of the buildings. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Let's let Jessica take that one. Um, okay. We all can take it, but Jessica, why don't you Great, I will jump in here. There's a lot to say about this, but the answer is, the short answer is yes. It can right now accommodate us electrifying um, and there are plans to make sure that the electric grid will keep up with the needs of the uh, of the needs of New Yorkers as we electrify. So um, it's a little bit wonky, but right now our grid is built um, so that we can serve basically so that we can air condition, all of the places that need to be air conditioned on the hottest days in the summer, because that's that's those are the moments when New Yorkers use the most electricity. And so our grid right now is built for that. As we switch people to heat pumps, what's going to happen is we're going to start increasing our electric use in the winter, but because our electric use in the winter right now is pretty low compared to the summer, we still have a lot of headroom as we electrify um, our heating. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a while before electrifying our heating starts to push up the needs of the electric grid because our electric grid is built for cooling in the summer. We also have this benefit that as we switch to heat pumps for cooling, we're going to bring down our 
peak energy use in the summer because heat pumps are such an efficient way to cool our homes. And that's gonna help us um, reduce costs in the summer, which is when our most expensive electricity is and our most dirty electricity happens because we rely on really dirty peaker plants for that summer peak. Um, so in the short term, our, we've got a lot of, we've got some time um, and we will see a lot of benefits from electrifying our heating. And, and as we go forward with this transition, we need to make sure that we are building renewable energy, renewable electricity and heat it and hitting our renewable electricity goals. And we need to make sure that we're pushing our utilities and our transmission providers to build the grid that we know we're going to need as we make this transition to electrify heating as well as transportation. Yeah, let me let me add to that because the other piece I sit on. <laughs> uh, well, no, I sit on. Um, New York State has just established an energy policy planning advisory council for this transmission investment investment process, and I sit on that body. And I just want to. <laughs> anyone's interested <laughs> in in advocating for for more transmission, um, hit up Climate Auntie, and I can plug you into that. But just these things are very much connected. And so um, it's like, it's, how do I say, like the same, the same utilities that may want to tell you that like the grid's not ready for electrification are the same utilities that are, as we speak, making their plans for how much they're going to get to invest, you know, to, you know, in transmission and related distribution infrastructure. And they are really excited about making sure those investments keep going into the traditional networks that they've always held on to. And so I love um, Jessica's, and that's what, it's sort of like both ends. Like I love Jessica gave you a very like specific, you know, response. And um, and that is spectacular. And there's always, it's just literally the easy way to keep your eye on the ball. Is this, is this resulting in the actual like, dismantling of of infrastructure and retirement of power plants <laughs> and less use of fossil fuels and combustion because if it is hello if it's not in large part some exceptions we could talk about no and some of it is i don't want to say like but there is a lot of fear mongering there are significant actual technical issues that have to be worked out carefully. They always want to paint us as the ones, right? Who want to make it so that your bills go sky high and you're cold in the winter. I always, you know, like we are not trying to hurt out here trying to hurt people. <laughs> so there, you know, so you'll hear that. There are substantive things to be worked through. They are being worked through and always keep your eye on the ball. Yeah, I want to just add one quick thing, which is, People talk about this transition as if it's going to happen overnight. It's going to take decades, decades. Yeah. Think of each building. We're talking about millions and millions of buildings. We're we're just, this bill will allow us to begin, <laughs> begin a gradual, safe, planned, sensible tra transition of our building's heating. And so there's absolutely no way that we can tank the grid with the pace uh, that the, this transition is gonna happen. And also to the extent that we can employ the geothermal technology and the thermal energy network technologies, we are talking about the most incredibly efficient heating and cooling technologies where buildings are connected to each other and to a shared, maybe a shared ground loop, that is actually gonna be a benefit for the grid. So there's, there's so many benefits to the transition that we are um, advocating for. Um, health, safety, economy, and everything, all, all of this rest of it is just nonsense. It's sort of like, yes, if we transitioned all the buildings and all the cars next year, it would tank the existing grid that we have right now. Well, of course it would, but no one's talking about that. And we would never advocate for that. And even if we did, it wouldn't be possible. So that's just nonsense. <laughs> even if we did, it could be done. But I think it's... It's important to remember that when we pass the New York Heat Act with all of your help, this is going to be the next, that's the next step we're going to take. And then we have to all join Raya <laughs> and many others in all of these different proceedings to keep this process going and to make sure that we are absolutely shutting down the gas system and building up the renewable system to make this transition possible. So we will not be done with the New York Heat Act, but we will 
work to pass the New York Heat Act this year. Well, so many and dominoes will fall. It's really important. This would be, there's so much backward movement on this stuff in the country. If we could get this momentum, it really would mean a lot. Momentum, sure. momentum. They made the goal of 1,200 uh, things, which is fantastic. <laughs> hey, Tim, if I could just jump in and um, I want to ask the panel a question and I want to give our 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 group here some information. So my first, my question is, how important do you guys think these messages are, these letters that people are sending in the app to your New York political leaders? I will tell you. Okay. We talk to legislators. They tell us, please send us more emails and call us more because we are hearing from National Grid and National Fuel and they, um, the American Petroleum Institute and their lobbyists and their fear-mongering robocalls all the time. And we need a stack of emails that we can show leadership to say, my constituents want this to happen. So they are actually literally begging us to lobby them. That's how important it is. I know it seems like nothing, just sticky saying yes to an app. It is something, it isn't everything, but all, it's an extremely important tactic. And the legislators have repeatedly asked us to, to lobby them more. <laughs> If you want to get fancy with it, like if you've already sent one, like, and, and and like send it as it is, but if you want to get fancy with it, go ahead and do that little like customized thing, like where you say, my name is Joe, la, 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 because it also, I think the volume ones are fantastic and the ones where you actually speak in your, you know, about yourself, those sometimes even get in a separate category. They do count them. They do count them. Yeah. And just so everyone understands, every message that you send with the Climate Action Now app begins, the very first sentence is a personal statement from you. Oh, and you, okay, can, my you can make it say whatever you want and make it as personal as you can so that they, mine is, is I, I'm a father who fears for my children in a warming world. But I, I know a 13 year old says, I'm a, I'm a Los Angeles kid who lost his home in a fire due to climate change. Make it as personal as you can. Um, yeah, so I, I asked you folks this question because I get asked this question all the time from people using the app. They, they say, well, are my messages, you know, really making a difference? Um, and I mean, I, I now know they, they really do make a difference. In fact, you know, it's, I, I'm the, the oh, well, let me ask you another question. Do you think that the, the gas industry in New York raising all these objections that they're raising. Do you think they're motivated by altruism? Are they really, it's really the interests of the new, the people of New York that is, that is animating their opposition to this law? I can jump in here. So <laughs> we need to remember not to personify large corporations. They are, they have a, they have a duty and a mission to make money for their shareholders. That is, that is what animates them. That is their purpose for being is to figure out how they can invest their shareholders' money in something and get a rate of return, a return on equity for their shareholders. And so what these utilities are, are going to be motivated by is what our law says they are allowed to invest in and make money for their shareholders. Um, and right now our law says they can invest money in the gas in gas infrastructure and make boatloads of money for their shareholders. And so that is what animates them and what they are motivated to do and what they are required to do. And, and that is what we're trying to change with the New York Heat Act. Um, and so, no, they are not motivated by altruism. There are some really great people that work within the utilities. They're not the people working in the utilities are not a monolith and we do not demonize them. Um, and there are many in there that are working to make this transition possible as best they can within the limitations of the corporation that they work within. But the corporation itself 
and what motivates the corporation itself, and that is what creates the rules for all the people that work for that corporation, is to invest in gas infrastructure and make money for their shareholders right now. Hey, thanks, everybody. I It's 7.56, unfortunately, so we're going to have to wrap it up. But um, I asked the panel if you've got any more thoughts or anything else you'd like to say on this subject while we have a few minutes left. I'll, the last thing I'll say is that the arguments are often too, you know, are often so disingenuous. Like, you know, this is going to cost too much. Our existing rates are through the roof and they're going up you know, every day, you know, you want to make people cold and miserable. Actually, no, we want people to be more comfortable in their homes. And you're the one who doesn't want, isn't committed to stopping the climate crisis. Like, you know, just that the, the misinformation really is that misinformation. So I, I, I just, I want to encourage folks um, that we really, we are trying to, to create a more comfortable, um, cleaner, um, and more, you know, and healthier future. That's what this is about. Yeah. Lisa or Jessica, do you have any last thoughts? I just want to thank everybody who gave some time on a Sunday night to come take action and to push um, for Climate Action New York and for to pass the New York Heat Act. Um, it's people like you, and you're joined by thousands of organizations and individuals across New York who are working to pass this bill. So um, we just, without you, we wouldn't be where we are. And without you, we won't pass the New York Heat Act. So we hope that you'll continue to stay involved and continue to take action with us over the next few weeks to get this bill over the finish line. Lisa? Yeah, same as Jessica. Thank you guys so much for being out here. I know you are missing the Lions Niners game. I was going to say. <laughs> um, and I've been checking the score in between sending emails and presenting to all of you, but um, that takes extra dedication. Um, and, um, you know, as I said, we just have, if you can turn your attention to this one climate action for the next few weeks, just between now and April 1st, and lean in, follow all those links we shared, maybe Tim um, will send them to you afterwards, uh, we can win this, but we definitely cannot win it without you. So please, um, thank you for being a part of this and uh, can't wait to see you on the next Zoom, on the next social media action on Wednesday with New Yorker News um, and in Albany um, on a, for those who can on March 13th, um, which is a Wednesday. All right, thanks so much. And thanks so much to Climate Action Now for hosting this party, to Anshul for loading the mini actions for Tim and Geraldine. It was a pleasure to, and to be a part of this panel and, and a privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I wanna remind everybody, first of all, thank you so much to our, our audience. As our friend Valdi is always willing to say, we don't have time. We need to get this done. And you guys are getting it done tonight. Um, I remind everybody, we've got a, a fantastic action party with Nathaniel Stinnett Tuesday night at seven o'clock, who's head of the Environmental Voter Project. Um, and please uh, tell your friends to get on this because the, the actions are gonna stay on there. That number, which was, I don't know what, 1300 and something, um, we'll see that it, that'll be 5,000 or 6,000 within the next couple of days. So, um, thank you all. Thank you so, so, so much. Have a great night. Thank you, everybody.